Well, I hope I'm not here to confuse you further. Uh, David Christian has this absolutely wonderful series of lectures called Big History. And it was mentioned earlier uh, by David. I thoroughly recommend it. And there's a lovely theme that he didn't quite mention today, so I want to talk about that myself in David's, uh, in David's lectures, Big History. And that is that all the complexity in this world, all the complication, has somehow arisen from successive integrations of simpler objects. When the Big Bang happened, uh, shortly thereafter, shortly is pretty shortly, like 10 to the minus 27 seconds or something, the story is told by physicists, I hope I don't garble it too much, but you start with some elementary objects, uh, possibly quarks, strings, whatever you want to start as very elementary, extraordinarily high energy. When things cool off a little bit, then combinations of quarks make atomic, uh, make protons and neutrons. Certain combinations of those make atomic nuclei. Those along with electrons make the first simplest atoms, hydrogen and helium, great gases and clouds, and huge concentrations of those coalesce into stars. The stars go through their cycles. It's, a, it's, it's like a book of Genesis, and then the stars went through their cycles. And they, give, they bring forth new combinations of heavy atoms, and in due course, in combination, some of those give us planetary systems like we have here on Earth. And the first primitive organic molecules, organic chemistries, and more complicated combinations of organic molecules give us sophisticated organic molecules, and then life itself, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Francois Jacob said it very nicely, the French molecular biologist. He says, in our universe, matter is arranged in a hierarchy of successive integrations of simpler elements. And I really do thoroughly recommend David's lectures on this because he doesn't just talk about this in cosmology. He talks about it across life itself, across biology, across history, across everything. There is a vast array of objects that interests me and interests many people in the room. And I want to talk about here where it all came from. That's the subject of my book. I'm thinking about technology. We have a lot of people interested, including Kevin Kelly and many others in the room. David Galerner, who's, uh, who's written about technology as well, and many, many of you. When I was studying graduate school, which is many eons ago in the bad old days in Berkeley, I was taught, and this was as an economist, I'd been, I'd been studying engineering, but I was taught that basically there weren't that many technologies. Maybe there were a few dozen or a few hundred that were of interest. And these had somehow been miraculously invented by some mysterious process that everybody refused to somehow to talk about and said, well, it's some creative thing. It's something that we can't quite talk about or get a handle on. We don't know where, quite how these things were invented, but they were invented. They appear in the economy. And the picture I had as an economist was that these things were standalone. They're like animals in zoology, and they were regarded as having their own character, but they weren't in any way related, and there was no common ancestry to any of them. And I swallowed all of this, and I believed it. The economy existed by itself as an object, and it would adopt these technologies. Something happened to me. I, I became a non-believer. Uh, in the mid-'80s, I started, I was working on the economics of technology in the mid-'80s in economics. And I started to seriously study technology. Uh, 
this was useful to have an engineering background, but I really started to study the origin of radar, the origin of the jet engine, the origin of magnetic resonance imaging, the origin of CT scanning, you name it. And I began to see the same story repeated, the same pattern again and again and again. I began to realize that technologies don't sort of come into being by some miraculous process. They're constructed always. They are put together from existing elements, and those existing elements themselves are technologies. I began to see this again and again, and I thought, well, there have to be some sort of exceptions. If there are, I haven't seen any yet. Let me give you an example of this. This isn't a very, um, it's not a very novel technology. It'd be somewhere in between standard engineering and something uh, out on the, on the, on the risky, uh, very, very uh, creative side of technology and that is the, the technology that allowed us to land people on the moon. Around about 1962, John Kennedy decides we're gonna put a man on the moon. And the creative process that follows is something like this. It's that engineers sit down at NASA, scientists sit down, and they start to examine what they have available. Well, we have multi-stage rocketry and so we could use rocketry to escape from the Earth's gravitation, or at least to boost us uh, to escape velocity. For sure we can do that. We know how to orbit satellites. In fact, we know how to orbit people, so we have that technology, orbiting technologies. We know how to put astronauts into space and keep them alive in a vacuum. We have that technology. And you see them thinking, they're thinking, well, we could do it sort of Jules Verne style, and we could just have one rocket that multi-stages would land in the moon. I'm thinking of some of those silent movies where the rockets come into the moon, and then they all sort of crunch up head first in the moon, and then they'd have the problem of, okay, that's fine, but there are people on board. We need to get them back. And that's, uh, like uh, David Christian said, that's a problem. <laughs> If you get them back, you have to think, okay, then we'd have to reverse the rocket, turn it uh, so that it can fly off, but it'd be a heavy object because it would have to contain enough fuel to get back. So maybe there's a better solution. Maybe we should actually orbit the moon with the heavy rocketry, and then we can have a much lighter landing vehicle, and that landing vehicle, we know how to do that as well. A lot of different possibilities and different combinations are thought of. It's rather like a poet writing a poem and saying, I can use this phrase, I can take those words, I can use these thoughts, and I can express them this way. So what I want to point out is that in all my investigations, I began to find out that, yes, invention is supremely creative. I don't want to deny that. It's as creative as poetry. It's as creative as doing exceptional architecture or as writing music. But all technologies, no matter how new, how novel, how created, are expressions of things that we can already do. It doesn't mean that engineers throw technologies up in the air and say, you know, let's see how they land and we'll get a few random combinations and those are gonna give us novel technologies. Everything is terribly carefully thought through and there's a multiplicity of possibilities. There's many possibilities that people think of and then some reasonable structure is put together, rather like lawyers sitting there and saying, okay, I want to argue this case, I'm gonna put a brief together. We can think of our argument as being constructed partly out of case law, partly out of past precedents, past judgments, partly out of the evidence, the witnesses, and it's all very carefully thought of, put together, alternatives are thought of. But the point I want to make is that every novel technology, all novel technologies, are expressions. They're constructions. They are put together from some combination of what already exists. 
And you can reverse the thought and start to think of, well, okay, suppose we have dozens of technologies that already exist or hundreds. And I think of those as maybe more vividly than they deserve, but I think of them as like little points of light or stars. And they exist somehow in the firmament of technology. Maybe there's not that many to begin with. And some of those stars start, forgive the uh, Irish imagination here, but some of those stars start to twinkle and they give birth as the combination that's necessary for a new technology. And that new technology itself becomes a new point of light. And in combination with yet other technologies, it gives us, again, something new. So you can tell a sort of Genesis story, and I do tell it in my book. In the beginning, we had, and I think in the beginning, we could ask David or other people, where do you want to draw the line for the beginning? But let's say 10,000 years ago, 35,000 years ago, we had certain technologies that existed supposedly on the forest floor. We could pick up those technologies. We could use wood for digging, pieces of wood. We could use stone for pounding. We could use certain fibers and vines for for tying things, and then we began to put together combinations. We could haft some piece of rock or stone to a piece of wood and bind it with the vines and create a simple hammer or a simple ax and so on. And so working this way right up to the present age, we have, starting from very simple and very few technologies, that simply use base phenomena and then start to create combinations and combinations made from those combinations. We have a vast system in which the few became many and the simple became incredibly complicated or complex. Just look at what's come out of simple transistor logic gates since the 1950s or 1960s. The build-out is it's a system that's building itself out of itself. I don't mean it's completely autonomous. Human beings are, of course, engaged in all of these inventions, but it's a vast system of elements or technologies, means to human purposes, that over time have, has built itself out of itself via us human beings. The build-out, it turns out, isn't homogeneous. And this started to fascinate me when I realized that I thought all of these points would be building out somehow like some gigantic exploding set of stars or, or galaxy. It's not that way. There's waves of technology. What happens is that clusters of technology come along, and those are based upon families of phenomena. So in the 1600s, we get the optical phenomena, and then that gives us telescopes and microscopes and other optical technologies. In the 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, we get the chemical phenomena, gives birth to all these chemical technologies, chemical industry. 1800s, the electrical phenomena, the electric motor dynamo and so on, transformers and AC and DC systems, electronics in the 20th century, photonics in the late 20th century, and now the genomic or genetic technologies and nanotech and so on. And occasionally we get clusters built around some particularly useful object like the steam engine or the steam locomotive or the computer. There's an interesting thing, again, I was taught as an economist that when technologies appear, business adopts them. What really happens to the economy is something different. Think of these bodies of technology. They seem to wash in maybe every 40 years, every 50 years, we see new ones washing along. The, the canals, the railroads, the electrical technologies, mass production, electronics, computation. Every 50 or 40 years, we get a new body of technology. But the economy doesn't adopt the body of technology. 